good evening uh, today we're going to discuss something very important very vital if you see and if you heard the ladakh and galwan valley what is happening it is about india china how strategy could be and what could be done in this situation let me give you the perspective at the moment now on the geopolitical front uh, until the news since yesterday india and china have been engaged in discussion to establish military and diplomatic channels to address the prevailing situation at lac commanders from pla in the army held a meeting at chosul and they're working round the clock to solve the problem again look little further at south china sea china is claiming entirely the south china sea breaking all the maritime law sea of law and indian ocean coming closer is flooded with the chinese submarine and that is a geopolitical part let's come back to geoeconomics today's world is and foreign policy is more based on geoeconomic the trade and investment we are aware of our chinese uh, threat investment and also the threat deficit which is tuned to 50 billion dollar also the complex issue of global supply chain uh, with china and the global threat these all issues we're going to discuss now on the topic today which is at india's strategic engagement with china and technological road map for this we have gathered some of the most distinguished panelists they are the foremost expert on china i'm starting with a uh, Professor Srikant Kondapalli, uh, uh, he is a professor in Chinese study at School of International Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is a guest faculty at National Defence College, College of Naval Warfare, and Army War College. He is the foremost Chinese expert known in India. Has published several books, monographs, edited several articles, taught worldwide, and he also includes some of the Chinese and Taiwanese university. Our second uh, uh, panelist. is left in a general r s panwa a distinguished general served 30 years in the indian army an expert on non kinetic warfare and disruptive military technology that's we're going to talk about how we prepare india for the future warfare and third the most ambassador ashok sajahan uh, who is famed during the when india opened the market in 1991 he was the part of the discussion of globalization liberalization move for india in many rounds of uh, interview a discussion with uh, who and wto so let's start a discussion but the point here is that are we too reactive than being proactive when it comes to china our foreign policy and defense policy i will start uh, with uh, professor srikant could you could you uh, uh, open the remark on our foreign policies and defense policy are we always reactive and then we prepare for them when is the time to be proactive especially about policy in the context of china i think in terms of the china policy uh, we are being very reactive as you rightly suggested uh, that is partly because of the asymmetry in power relations uh, with our 14 trillion dollars gdp of china to about 3 trillion dollars gdp of india there is a huge variance uh, however uh, if you learn from uh, kim jong un north korea Uh, who has a gdp of 52 billion dollars uh, he had brought down a 18 trillion dollar gdp country to singapore and hanoi for two summit meetings with president trump so it also basically is a function of how you're going to use asymmetry in power relations um sometimes the leadership has to be disruptive uh in its approach uh in order to um uh in order to serve the national interests uh if you have a conservative approach as we have had before uh then it is quite possible that we will be in a reactive mode uh secondly i think it is also a, re a reflection of our interactions with the outside world uh in terms of usage of uh, hard power and soft power um in the recent times of course we have used the uh, major power equation as a major um, policy directive uh, i think this is good and it provides for certain tools for us in the longer term to be more proactive in our positions for instance the act east policy or indian ocean diplomacy or the uh, integrated defense staff suggestion for the uh, primary focus in the indian ocean uh, and secondary focus on the south china sea 
uh, these are all measures which will provide scope for India in the longer run. So there are some measures that have been already undertaken, uh, both in the foreign policy as well as in the uh, military sphere, uh, where we are seeing some fruits of this. Uh, so uh, we are in a transition between reactive to that of a proactive position. For example, the third uh, aspect is in terms of a neighborhood first policy that has been enunciated for nearly a decade now, but more prominently in the last five years. Uh, so so we, are, we are drawing red lines, amber lines and green lines for countries of concern for us. So that is a proactive policy that we have initiated. Uh, I'll, I will, I'll thank you, uh, 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 Professor. We'll come back to uh, General Panwar. Uh, you have been you know, very much acquainted with the way how the defense uh, and military works in India. We have had much of intelligence uh, of Chinese gathering uh, very close to LAC. Uh, and then this unfortunate incident which happened uh, last month. Do you, do, you want, do, do you see this as we are also uh, uh, not reactive? We should be uh, ready for that. We should have our intelligence gathered. What, you, what is your perspective on this uh, general convert? Which unfortunate incident, though it was premeditated, uh, it was well calculated by China, but still, are we not ready for such incidents, uh, which will be very frequent coming days? Uh, to General Parman. I'll take off from where Dr. Shrikant uh, said about being transitioning from reactive to proactive. You see, uh, as far as technology is concerned, while we have been making progress over the last two, two or three decades in our ISR, that is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, technologies, and our space segment has grown, but it has not grown to the extent it could have had we been taking the right actions. That's how I would put it. So while information would have been there uh, on the incident that you're talking about, uh, well, uh, from intelligence gathering point of view, we can do much more than what is uh, there at the moment. And so uh, in the course of our discussion, uh, we'll discuss more about what exactly is to be done to ensure that you know, where is the imbalance today as far as India versus China is concerned militarily? We have the best soldiers. We have a very decisive leadership as of now. And uh, we are battle hardened, which China is not. So these are our assets. And we have the best minds in the country. What is actually lacking is uh, a synergy for putting these all together to ensure that as far as our equipment and technology and systems are concerned, uh, they are uh, the best in the world. So that is where we have to work. And this is in line with what Dr. Shrikant also said, we have to move more towards the proactive sense and put in strategic thinking into action. Uh, uh, now back to uh, Ambassador Ashok, you, know, you are the man behind India's entry into the global trade. Uh, you have been... Uh... Uh, seeing very closely how the global supply chain is intermixed worldwide. Now, with such incident with the China, uh, uh, again, there is a call, and rightly so, from the public, you know, to, to Art Nirbhar Bharat, use our own products, use our own uh, services and brands. But then our trade with China, and so the global supply chain interlinked is a huge. How do you see such a dichotomy in this situation now? From the global perspective, as you have been responsible for India's entry, uh, one of the key diplomats in that time in 1991, uh, how do you look at you know, uh, now the situation from the era you were there? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, Manish, and thank you very much, Dr. Anurag Batra, for having me on this program. Delighted to have this opportunity to share my thoughts. Manish, if you permit, uh, you know, for just uh, one minute, I will go back to the question that you had posed posed to Dr. Kondapalli and to General Panwar as to whether we are reactive or whether we are proactive. Please you know, go ahead. What, yeah, what I would like to say is that at least over the last five, six years, I don't want to go beyond that. I think uh, the government has been quite proactive in terms of reaching out, in terms of looking at opportunities 
and capitalizing upon them. And I could give you a number of examples, both in the area of diplomacy, in area of foreign policy, as also in area of defense. But I'll just give you one or two examples. In terms of the upgradation of our ties with the United States, that has been quite phenomenal over the last six years. And uh, you look at, uh, uh, because I think here, what we are also seeing is, there is not only a convergence of values, but also a convergence of interest. In terms of our relations with countries in the Middle East, in West Asia, I think we've never had such uh, vibrant and such dynamic relations. Our relations with Japan, our relations with Australia, with ASEAN also, and at the same time trying to build our relations with Russia. So in the area of foreign policy and diplomacy, I think we have done well. In the area of defense also, very briefly, I think for, the, for 10 years before that, there were no acquisitions that had taken place. But uh, we, uh, the government went out of its way. What you see now in our uh, arsenal, whether it is the Chinook or the Apache or the PHI or S-400 or Kamo 2060 or T-90, I think these are all things that have happened over the last uh, uh, few years. So I would say that the government has been quite proactive in both these areas. Now, coming to the question that you have posed, in terms of the uh, huge uh, trade deficit that India has with China, you know, ballpark figure, if one could look at it, the two-way trade turnover is about $90 billion or so. The uh, Ch uh, China exports uh, about $75 billion. We export about $15 billion. And uh, this $60 billion is unsustainable. And I think this has been told to China many a times. You would recall, even when the Wuhan summit took place in April of uh, 2018, even at that time, that was an informal summit. But uh, Prime Minister Modi was telling President Xi Jinping whether we can export non-Basmati rice, agricultural products. The point here is India is quite competitive in a large number of areas. But what we face are non-tariff barriers going into their market. So you see that uh, while our, from 2000 to 2018, our trade deficit with China has increased by 291 times, while China's trade surplus with other countries has increased by a figure of about 16 times. So the non-tariff barriers that uh, afflict our exports, also, I think we are not competitive as yet in a large number of areas. Also, in terms of policy framework, you know, if uh, going forward, you would like me to elaborate and amplify on that, I'll be very happy. But just to mention that uh, uh, you mentioned also about the global supply chains and the global value chains. China has emerged as the factory of the world. So right. there are items that we used to manufacture earlier ourselves. You know, these days we are talking a great deal about export of pharmaceuticals because that is something India has become the pharmacy of the world. But we don't export any pharmaceuticals to, uh, to China. On the contrary, we are importing huge quantities of APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredients. It is not as if that is rocket science. It is easy. India was manufacturing them earlier. Our IDPL, the Indian Drug Pharmaceutical uh, laboratory, uh, uh, Factories, PSUs, they were manufacturing them. But because we started getting them at somewhat cheaper prices from China, that we stopped the production and manufacture. It can be started again. Uh, the last point here I would make is there are a number of items and we should need, uh, we really need to go about in a focused, targeted manner, step-by-step -step approach. What the Prime Minister said, before COVID-19 struck us, we were manufacturing minuscule quantities of masks, of gloves, of PPEs. Today, we are manufacturing more than 2 lakh units of these items per day. So India can do it. I think both the policy framework as well as the business community, and of course the consumers, we need to come together. It ha has to be a whole of the country approach. Then I think we can really increase 
our competitiveness and also try to reduce the 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 uh, unsustainable trade deficit that we have in china and that's the so very pertinent points we have raised which we will further discuss and dissect you know but now we'll come back to our chairman and editor uh, of business world so I, i'm here because manish invited me um, I, i'm not an expert in china i'm actually not an expert in anything i know lil i'm a student of but, but but let me tell you uh, first but, of all but, dr batra let me ask a question i want to ask This is a third China debate, right? We've done two, right. and we have equally. But sir, allow me, allow me one question to you, and then you can proceed. I see you first as, of course, as editor, you have responsibility. But you also an entrepreneur. Uh, you know the joy of a uh, entrepreneur, and also the pain of entrepreneur. I come back to situation with the threat with the China. Really larger question. We, we we can we talk about such a ban on Chinese product right away. What is the way you think as entrepreneur which you see because you know the investment you know the certain. I'll give you a logical point of view though when it comes to China, uh, emotions run high. So I'll give you the logical point of view and it may not be the most popular point of view. In the short term, it is very difficult to disintegrate yourself from the supply chain. Uh, Ambassador Sajana talked about the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, look at the Indian companies that are Chinese investments. I mean, you take a sector. and there is a company uh, now zomato the uh, next round of funding was coming from a chinese investor that has stopped so one i think uh, we have to be as ambassador sajana rightly said we have to be competitive and competitiveness comes from three things cost of land labor uh, laws and reforms and most importantly china does well because the cost of capital is zero or close to zero i mean you're funded by the government practically uh, you look at any big company uh, so i think we have a disadvantage we start so in the short term you know as a temporary measure we can do it as because this uh, sentiment is against china but in a practical way in the next few years at least next one to two years unless until we build alternatives i don't think we can suddenly disengage that uh, that doesn't work uh, both from an investment standpoint from a supply chain standpoint and most importantly uh, you know there is a certain competitiveness in when we source from china by the way there was a survey done about 3 weeks back uh, and he was on our china show that survey asked uh, this was one week after the uh, when it came to light so it was around 22nd june and uh, indian consumers and about 10000 consumers were asked will you be willing do you have a problem with buying chinese products and at that time 81% said we don't have right and i'm sure as the sentiment became even more against china that number may have come down to 70 60 and again saying something is another doing it is another right but yeah. there is a certain uh, sentiment against china um, in india globally my question i want to ask a question to uh, professor shrikant kondapalli one is what is china thinking we have some idea of what we are thinking what the government is thinking what do you think china is thinking and another add on question is when do you think we can catch up with china let's say you we get everything right we get capital right uh, we get every other component of the policy Do you think we can ever catch up with China? This is a question. Uh, the, yes. Uh, on the first question, what do the Chinese think? Uh, I think uh, the uh, uh, Chinese have a disdain for the Indian developments as of now, uh, and uh, they do not actually mention uh, anything about India because they um, overlook the Indian developments. Uh, privately, of course, they say you know we have sent the Mars mission. Uh, we have had uh, substantial uh, software. Um, Indians have huge mathematical calculations and so on. Uh, you know, those are the stereotypes. But uh, overall, there is a uh, looking down upon approach from China uh, in various sectors. Uh, this is partly because we are a democracy uh, and we are trying to, you know, um, uh, develop our uh, various systems. Uh, while china has been an authoritarian model and they do find that this is a 
major constraining feature for them to sell uh, to the rest of the world uh, in terms of China model versus India model. In fact, there is a center for uh, China model studies in Shanghai, uh, which generally tries to promote this model, uh, which has basically, number one, authoritarianism from a political perspective, uh, which also has control over the labor that you mentioned just now in terms of labor laws. Um, secondly, it has a control over the capital in terms of state-owned enterprises. Um, uh, if you look at the top 10 um, banks in the world, the state-owned banks of China have made their mark uh, in terms of capitalization. So uh, there is, that is also part of the China model, uh, the state-controlled institutions. Uh, thirdly, it also has um, uh, the special economic zones, uh, manufacturing uh, as a manufacturing hub of the world uh, and so on. But I trace all these to the American blessings since 1979, Tan Xiaoping visit to the White House in February that year. Uh, there was a deal to, uh, to make China rise. Uh, a similar statement Condoleezza Rice made in Sofia University in February 2005, that we want to make India a, a major power in the world. Of course, we did not pick up the threats like the Chinese did. Uh, we were slow in that process um, because of our own internal discussions, etc. cetera. Um, but most important uh, to address the second issue that you raised is that the, the Chinese rise was based on the American blessings. Of course, the Chinese worked hard for this to become the second largest economy uh, and uh, my suggestion is that we can catch up with China. In fact, we can surpass China uh, if we do the internal balancing uh, substantially as with the external balancing in future. Uh, so for instance, uh, we have several programs like the Make in India, Digital India, uh, Sagar Mala and various others, uh, which are basically trying to restructure the internal dynamics. Um, not in the same path that the Chinese did since 1979, uh, but readjusting to our own model, uh, which is democratic in nature, uh, and uh, to the catering to the, to the people and civil society as a whole. Uh, we have a free press. Uh, when you look at the COVID-19 addressing by China and by India, you find this very stark. Uh, China simply shut down the whole city of Wuhan and Hubei province. Uh, with untold miseries for the people. Uh, however, today they call this as more efficient, uh, even though we do not know exactly how many people are dead or uh, you know, affected by the COVID-19. Um, but in India, we, have, we can go outside to get the essentials. The press is free to report uh, any uh, problems in COVID-19 uh, addressing of that issue. Uh, and various other liberties that we have had. So I was trying to suggest that we can even surpass that of China uh, if we have the internal balancing and external balancing. All our fundamentals are right. You have the uh, third largest scientific manpower in India, engineers, doctors, and others. Uh, you need a more concerted leadership uh, for this section to you know, expand their energies. Uh, secondly, we have a good service sector, 59%, um, which is non-polluting, uh, beneficial to the environment uh, and to the middle class. Uh, we again have a huge middle class, 400 million middle class, uh, which buy all these and sustain the economic development process. Unlike in China, where there is uh, hardly any domestic demand, we have a huge domestic demand on, on the other hand. We also have other advantages like the 150 year old stock exchange. Uh, it's only recently Shanghai Stock Exchange started operating because of the market driven economy. Of course, their capitalization is pretty high than compared with the Mumbai Stock Exchange, uh, but, we, but uh, our people know how to make money uh, out of this. Uh, it is a huge uh, historical background that we have 
since the British times. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is an advantage uh, in terms of speculation and you know making money and so on and so forth. Uh, also, we have other advantages um, uh, which the Chinese do not have. Their advantage is in terms of the manufacturing sector, which we are now trying to replicate by increasing the 14% uh, of the GDP to roughly about 27% uh, manufacturing sector component. We are trying to do that. Uh, second advantage they have is the infrastructure projects. Uh, they have invested about $10.54 trillion in the infrastructure as against our recent uh, estimate of nearly a trillion dollars investment. So, so 10 times higher than the Indian contribution on the on the uh, infrastructure projects. But what is important is that we are raising these through civil society participation. We are raising these through the savings that we have acquired instead of the FDI or other outlets. Uh, uh, for instance, the public-private partnership deals are mainly in terms of mobilizing our private uh, sector in this process. So we have a lot of advantages which could easily take us far beyond even the Chinese uh, GDP, not in the immediate future, of course. Um, uh, for instance, they are highly connected to the uh, external market, while we are not connected and we have that cushion. Uh, COVID-19 or no COVID-19, we can still survive because um, we only have about a quarter of our GDP uh, in terms of exports and imports. In comparison to nearly 40% of their GDP, which is on the high seas in terms of exports and imports. So there is a vulnerability that China has. Uh, in addition, we have a, on an average, we are 26 years old uh, in India, compared to 36 years old in China, and the aging process is uh, really increasing substantially. So there are advantages that India can pick up uh, and you know surpass the Chinese GDP figures. Uh, they have plummeted from nearly uh, six percentage GDP points to roughly about 1.2 percent. Uh, and of course, they are recovering in this quarter. Um, uh, nevertheless, it also shows China has more vulnerabilities than India in terms of the growth rates. And as the uh, increment turns against China, possibly future for a lot of manufacturing facilities may not be the same, which will impact the GDP. And I just want to comment on one thing that, uh, you know, China also did this because China wanted to, uh, us not to be close to the US. In fact, with what China has done in the last 30 days, we, we, we will seek to balance and possibly grow closer to the US, which will have its own economic dividend which will also help us kind of catch up with China. So I just wanted to buttress that point. Ambassador Sajanath, uh, on the economic aspect, uh, what is China thinking? You know, China know, we know what India is thinking. China knows what the world is thinking. Do we really know what China is thinking? On the economic aspects, uh, Dr. Batra, you want, yeah. Basically, you know, there have been, uh, as you mentioned yourself, and as some of the panelists have also mentioned, that there has been this, after, particularly after the 15th of June, there has been this outcry in India of boycotting China. Now, this is not the first time that it has happened, because it has happened, you know, as far as the people are concerned. I think whenever you have festivals, whenever you have Holi, Diwali, etc., people say, should we get these colors from there? Should we get the statues of our gods and goddesses from there? Can't we make it ourselves? So there have been these uh, sort of uh, sentiments that have been expressed. But I would like to say that right now where we are is something very different from what we have experienced earlier. Because here now it is not only the people, but it is also the business. And Dr. Batra, since you are involved in it, uh, I'm sure you would also... Uh, have heard from your own uh, colleagues and your own uh, partners as to what is the sentiment amongst them. And it is also in the government. And as far as government is concerned, you can see, you see earlier, whatever it used to happen, government used to uh, fall back on the position that all these issues are related to our commitments and obligations under the WTO. 
So we cannot really do anything much about it. But I think right now government has recognized, my own conversations have uh, revealed a couple of things. You know, we put uh, the investments, the FDI coming in from China, from the automatic route, we took it to a scrutiny and government approved route, which means that we are uh, cognizant of the problems that this, uh, this can create. We have uh, taken the 59 apps of uh, uh, China out of this. Initially, people were saying that it is not really going to have much of an impact, but I think it is going to have a very serious impact. Then we have many of our ministers who have come forward. You know, Mr. Nitin Gadkari, he said roads, transport, etc. We are not going to give any contracts to Chinese firms. We have seen uh, power minister uh, R.K. Singh also saying the same thing. Mr. Piyush Goyal also talking about this. And uh, we know that as far as all these aspects are concerned, India is not a member of the government procurement agreement. India is not a member of the information technology agreement. The China is not recognized as a market uh, uh, status uh, country. So whatever actions in terms of uh, uh, anti-dumping duties, etc., they can be taken against China without much of a problem. China will not be able to take us to WTO. So I think here we also have the government and in the area of uh, economy, the government has a number of options available. The most important in my view would be two or three I will mention. Number one is banning Huawei and ZTE from the Indian telecom market. We have seen the United States doing it. We have seen UK doing it. We see a number of other countries looking at it, Australia and others looking at it. And I think if the largest growing market in the world India were also to take uh, this decision. This would be a huge setback on uh, the ambitions of uh, Huawei and ZTE. And we know uh, China might say that these are private companies, but we know that the relationship between this private uh, sector and the government. Uh, uh, Ambassador, very... Ambassador Ashok, I just to interrupt you, the, the banning Huawei has been in the talk before. It was banned before. There were many concerns also raised from military about Huawei putting their, uh, of course, devices, bug and, and information can uh, go back to uh, why our political leadership uh, backed down on this, why this debate has come you know, after Manish, such I want to say this, there is no way I can substantiate this, but there has been a suspicion that over the last few years, the Chinese think tanks and Chinese, you know, friendly professionals have kind of impressed upon our bureaucracy that... Uh, we somehow need them. If I'm trying to put it in a way that, right. you know, uh, I get no, my you're message. Very right. You're very right, Dr. And very quickly, if I were just to sort of finish. The policies, the if you look at Manish, some of the circulars, I mean, they look like they've been written by Chinese professionals and not by Indian bureaucracy. Uh, very smartly. Uh, and I'm, I'm being very direct about that, right? Indeed. But there's no, otherwise, there's no point. I think that's the reason the ban on Huawei hasn't happened. Because at the end of the policy are written by bureaucrats. And uh, sometimes uh, just they convince the merit. I'm not saying, because they spent so much time, effort in the last few years trying to impress why we need them, why we need their technology, why their technology is okay, why it is cheaper. And price does matter in everything. So it is better and cheaper. So, you know, those have been the logical argument. There may be other dimensions too. No, no you rightly like said, you like said, Dr. Bhatra, it's, it's, uh, it's time to be direct and there's no point mincing words. So, so uh, over to uh, Ambassador Ashok. Please go ahead, Ambassador. Yeah, no, just uh, one uh, comment uh, more that I wanted to make. What you said, Dr. Batra, is very, very correct because uh, China is uh, known to influence through a variety of means its interlocutors in different countries, whether they are in think tanks, whether they are in academia, whether they are in bureaucracy, whether they are in politics, everywhere we have seen there are huge reports coming out of Australia, coming out of uh, the United States. So if that is happening there, I think a democracy like India would also be a very easy prey as far as uh, uh, China is concerned. And China is used to getting its way 
either through threats or intimidation or inducements or bribery. So, you know, they don't leave any aspect unturned. The last point that I want to make here is, uh, you know, coming back to your first question, Dr. Batra, which you said, uh, what do Chinese think about it? The Chinese have always been thinking that uh, India has no other way. It cannot go anywhere else. Yeah. All the items that you are importing, whether it is uh, computer chips, whether it is uh, APIs, as I mentioned, whether it is electronics or any of the other I items, they feel that India has nowhere else to go. We will not be able to get that price and that quality from anywhere. And that is why they have been quite uh, dismissive about any of these calls. But I think we have seen, as people say, you know, before Corona and after Corona, these are going to be two different worlds. I think for India, before Galwan, before 15th April and after Galwan, I think our relationship with China is going to be very different. This is a watershed point. This is an inflection point in our relationship. And I think it will be reflected very much as far as our bilateral economic relations are concerned, because that is one area which will hurt China the most. And the final yeah. comment on this is, you know, people say that $60 billion trade surplus of China with India is uh, minuscule because the $75 billion exports to India are 3% of their total exports. But they forget to uh, remember that the 60% trade surplus is the second highest trade surplus for China, next only to that of the United States. With the United States, they have a 400 billion trade surplus. With India, they have 60 billion. And India is a good market. It's a growing market. It's an expanding market. They need access to this market. If their entry is in some way uh, not, I will not say banned, because I agree fully with you, it cannot be done overnight. It has to be staggered. It has to be calibrated. It has to be a step-by-step -step approach. But if access to this market is in some way restricted, if not totally denied to them, it is going to have a very severe adverse impact on their own economic uh, potential. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Sok. Now, I'll, can I come back to uh, Lieutenant General uh, Aris Panwa? Uh, General is authority on a network-centric warfare, cyber warfare, and, and I think the future, while we're talking about the problems, how we deal with the China, we need to focus on how to prepare ourselves against China. Our policies were not clear. You know, our defense policies, <clears throat> if you say, not on the surface against China. It is time to fix that. General, could you talk about what is the way we can deal with the China in the future? I'm sure there will not be the traditional war is going to happen with two armies confronting each other. Our wars in the future would be kinetic, you know, would be psychological. And you are the authority on that. You have been awarded by the president uh, 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 on this subject while you were in, in the service. Could you, could you comment, could you cite your in, uh, key inputs on this, General? Yeah, but before that, let me make a comment on the Huawei ZT yes, uh, discussion which was going on. We were talking from an economic point of view, but there's a huge security implication which is there. And I think as Ambassador Sajanar brought out that what happened on 15th is to be considered as an inflection point, as a watershed moment. From here onwards, it's a mistrustful relationship with China. And there is no question, in my mind, there is no question at all that we can accept Huawei 5G equipment in our national networks. There's no question at all. In fact, UK has banned it two days back against great pressure uh, for not doing it. And that is purely from the security perspective. And of course, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, General Parvan, again, I would like to in just question again, from the military perspective, you were the part of such a key echelon. There were cases against Huawei, the concrete cases, or the based on the potential threat from the Huawei uh, in terms of uh, getting into our security network. What is the reality as per your uh, understanding for the forces for a long time? Yeah, okay. My understanding is very clear and simple. You see, the, uh, when we say Huawei equipment, we are basically talking of 5G uh, infrastructure here. So 5G per se is a software intensive technology. And anything that is software in, uh, intensive 
whatever you may do to you know scrutinize the security backdoors etc it can only be done one time and subsequently again there'll be an update and so there's a huge security issue involved with 5g and when you have a mistrustful relationship and the aspect that it's all state controlled as far as china is concerned there's civil civil military fusion of course that's in the military <coughs> direction but wherever there's a state control and the data the laws are there for making the data available to the government there is no question of any uh, nation which has got any adversarial uh, relationship with china to be able to accept this in your key networks in your communication networks which is a nerve center of your country so in my perspective firstly there is a huge security issue and there should there is not an iota of doubt in my mind that it will not be accepted in our communication networks so that's about the uh huawei and 5g part it's also linked to the digital silk road and all which uh, we, we can uh, if time permits we we'll discuss so let me come to you the question which you asked now you see uh, we are talking on this strategic engagement with china and from a defense perspective now we need to understand the changing nature of warfare so uh, and we have disruptive technologies leading to these changing nature of warfare so what are these disruptive technologies that you are talking about today you mentioned network centric warfare and information warfare these really are um, uh, operational paradigms which have emerged from the information and communication technologies now information communication technologies are not new they have been there for the last couple of decades and they were first in fact impact was felt during the iraq first iraq war onwards and it is still being felt and is still unfolding so to say so uh, when we uh, when we talk of information warfare there are two aspects really one is a network centric warfare what is network centric warfare it's essentially your battle control systems automated artillery automated air defense automated battle surveillance all these things when the decision making comes into the something called a shooter decision maker sensor sh uh, decision maker shooter loop so the whole combat effectiveness goes up if you bring in the information and communication technology so this is one angle the other angle is information war information warfare now we hear so much about cyber warfare uh, we hear about psychological warfare a lot these days influence operations and all we don't hear too much about electronic warfare now that's in the ele electromagnetic spectrum so the combination of these three cyber electronic and psychological warfare is what makes up essentially information war now we have to see i mean uh, what has china done these concepts really emanated from the us in uh, a couple of decades back china studied those concepts brought it they brought out their own doctrines they have doctrines something called the integrated network electronic warfare which is a combination of cyber and electronic warfare and then they have a three warfares doctrine the three warfares comprises of psychological legal and media now we have been seeing the effects of psychological and legal warfare in uh, all this galwan affair and even in the doklam affair you know all these video clips and all and your uh, social media messaging which comes through including the influencing of our bureaucracy and others which uh, ambassador sajanar was talking about it's all part of the three warfares concept of china so this is really all an emission and what has china done in its reform of its uh, its pla which has happened over the last few years the reforms one of the primary aspects other than uh, theaterization of their commands where that's one thing which has happened another very important thing which has happened is the coming of the pla special support force now the special support force is really an operationalization of both the network centric warfare and the information warfare what has happened is the space and information warfare components which was spread over several departments of china have been brought into one force so there's a synergy between space and information warfare there's a synergy between psychological operations cyber and electronic and there's a synergy between attack defense i'll not go into that what i'm trying to say is china has operationalized it in a matter of years 
and it's now their operation is much better than what even the us has done so this reflects their agility in 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 changing with the changing nature of warfare you know so that's what we have to keep in mind and what should be our reaction we are talking of a strategic responses our reaction firstly in very simple terms we have a defense cyber agency which has just been approved uh, last year or so it's just been operationalized in a million sense it's a weak response what we have to do is we have to come up with a full fledged cyber command and these are areas where we have the expertise i mean uh, we are all you know software and cyber etc there is all a soft expertise where, where india has got no dearth of expertise so we can build it up so we have to come up with things like that and space segment has we have a expertise in space focus has to be there to bring up the defense segments of space so the space segment also has to be built up and we have the inherent expertise within the country but that is not where it ends now let me just take it a little forward when we talk of these disruptive technologies so this is what is unfolding today and will keep on unfolding over the next decade or so the very next thing which is going to transform the warfare in a completely different uh, manner is artificial intelligence now artificial intelligence is going to bring about the next revolution in warfare and we are seeing the first uh, few uh, you know manifestations of artificial intelligence in military operations in this drone and we hear of this swarm intelligence etc so china is investing billions of dollars into these disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence quantum technologies nano technologies these are the ones which we now have to leap frog into you know all the conventional things which we talk about the tanks and the aircraft and the ships etc well uh, that we can uh, that is one way of looking at it but very soon over the next couple of decades the importance of these heavy you know platforms which are manned will go uh, will become secondary we have already seen in all these uh, battles which are taking place uh, uh, across the world how drone warfare has replaced air force in a similar manner all unmanned systems they are called lethal autonomous weapon systems now this is over the next two decades this is going to replace so the focus if we have on acquisition of tanks today it is required tanks and aircraft aircraft lot of focus is the aircraft ships submarines all these things are a lot of focus and we must acquire there's no doubt about that but then we in parallel need to focus on our inherent expertise and boost up our defense r&d now i can spend some time on that provided time permits how we can boost up our defense r&d where is it what is it that we need to do to boost up our defense r&d to be agile enough to be in tune with the changing nature of warfare and equal if not surpass as dr shrikant said surpass china in these areas i think very rightly uh, defense r&d is one of the points you know we just spent about 6% of our total defense budget and out of 6% 3% goes to the maintenance of drd our sole agency of building managing and innovating our defense technology huge huge gap there but now i'll come back to the policy part uh, i'll i'll come back to professor shrikant uh, again uh, we our foreign policies and also defense policies is, is, is an urgent response sort of uh, look at the wuhan summit look at the mahabalipuram summit but we have not come up with something called a solid policy against china which de define china as our permanent adversary and we must prepare against that have we not reach out uh, to to international partner have we not formed our such policy say the quad why we are so reluctant to define a military policies uh, against china form a, a coherent alliance uh, among the nations say the quad with japan us uh, 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 and australia and and then go ahead it's a definite response what what do you think about such lines uh, professor srikant especially when it comes to the policies against china uh, I, i think we have had uh, some steps in that direction for example in uh, november 2017 Uh, we have had the indo-pacific meeting uh, in tanang in uh, vietnam uh, and uh, uh, later on we have had uh, the 2+2 dialogue process between us and india uh, 
uh, we have intensified the two plus two dialogue with Japan, that is defense and foreign ministries exchanges. Uh, we also had the foreign minister ministerial meeting of the Quad members uh, in September last year uh, in New York. Uh, so it is not true that we have not been able to make uh, progress on the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. Uh, however, of course, uh, there is the lingering influence of strategic autonomy within the Indian foreign policy uh, because of various reasons. Number one, we do not know how the US would be responding uh, in a different context. Um, uh, as you know that the Trump administration had changed radically several policies vis-a-vis -vis its own allies like the NATO partners or Japan, <laughs> South Korea and so on. So this is one uh, which is weighing in the Indian mind, uh, policy makers mind that uh, we have a, a certain uncertainty uh, on the uh, external domain. Uh, secondly, with the tariff wars between US and China, this uncertainty has been expanded towards the economic gamut of things as well uh, because of the uh, tariff wars uh, across the board. Even for India, for instance, uh, we have a $26 billion surplus with the US at one time. Um, uh, and so we are now um, importing LNG uh, and other products from the US, even though it is pretty far from the Indian coast uh, we have made that decision to import from the US. Uh, so I think there are several uh, complications, complex factors uh, in the policy making. Um, the uncertainties are staring at us. Uh, and if you join the uh, military alliance, uh, there is also the activation of the borders that need to be uh, considered. Um, uh, so these are so many things that are which are weighing in the Indian policy. The second aspect I would like to stress is India has a, has its own aspirations are displayed. Uh, for instance, as Foreign Secretary uh, Dr. Jay Shankar mentioned that India is actively now considering to play leading role in the international affairs. So, for instance, in the Solar Alliance. Uh, this has been uh, put forth more forcibly, uh, but also in terms of international law uh, on the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, or promotion of democracy abroad, uh, which is where we are contributing more for the UN fund. Uh, and as we discussed before, in the Indian Ocean, there is a lot of thrust that India is making. So. In many areas, there is a certain um, new feature that has been added. Uh, also, for instance, the National Security Advisor, Mr. Ajit Doval told a Mumbai uh, meeting that we are now looking at how uh, not to punch above or below the belt. So punching appropriately, that is where the hard power, soft power related aspects are now being uh, adjusted in terms of how. Um, so as, as a result, we had the URI surgical strikes. We had the Balakot strikes. Uh, and currently, of course, the Ladakh events. So uh, we are also experimenting with this, which is new uh, compared to the, say, uh, several decades ago. So I think there is a, a new feature within the Indian government uh, in terms of looking at the Indo-Pacific quad uh, because they have a huge say on the maritime domains, uh, but we are also making advances in other fields such as in space, in uh, maritime, in cyber domain, uh, and others what is generally called as new domains. Uh, so there is a concerted effort in this direction in the recent times. Uh, uh, Ambassador uh, so I take a uh, cue from, you know, we, uh, Professor Srikant spoke about uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I would like to know what would be the response of the world in a post-COVID, uh, uh, you know, uh, after the post-COVID scenario, how the world would respond to the China's Belt and Road Initiative, though was already marred with so much of uh, uh, debt financing and uh, such allegations on China. Uh, can India fill such gap, you know, in the world uh, uh, trade? 
uh, can we take advantage now? We don't have certain policies, even though uh, uh, at the moment now to confront China of such scale. Uh, how do we tackle that? How do we build a, build up our economy based on that? And how do we export and you know, take advantage of the situation? So uh, excellent so question, uh, Manish. And just give me one moment, and I will uh, also address uh, you know your earlier question, and that is in terms of you know how have we been trying to engage with China? You know, our policy from 1988 till now really has been one of constructive engagement, you know, which is when uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi visited there. Then there was an agreement between the two sides that the more contentious issue of the uh, disputed border, we put it on the back burner and we look at other areas where we can work together and we can advance the relationship. So that was trade, that was investment, that was culture, that was people to people, that was tourism, that was education, and so many other things. So that has uh, moved forward. But I think what India also did in between was, after all, China is a huge country. It is the uh, second largest economy now. It is uh, uh, both territorially as well as population wise, it is huge. We have a 3,500 year. 488 kilometers border with it. So we don't want to be unnecessarily provocative. So that is why when the first quad came up in 2004 after the tsunami, and then we had the first exercises in 2007, and China showed some displeasure. So Australia moved out and the quad did not go forward. But then in 2017, quad has again had a reincarnation, a rebirth. And it is going forward. And uh, we see that going forward now, even uh, Australia might be invited to be a part of the Malabar exercises. So I think India has been engaging with the China in as constructive a manner as possible. But where our critical, where our core interests are involved, we have put our foot down. And I'll just give you one or two examples. One is in Doklam. The other is in terms of construction of infrastructure in the border areas. You know, one of the issues that has come up as to whether that was the reason for this uh, uh, Ladakh incident and the other incidents, because we had the Darbuk, Shyok, uh, Dalatbek, Oldi Road that was being constructed. Yes. And the third most important, and I'll come back to your uh, question now, is that of the Belt Road Initiative. As you know, India was uh, one of the uh, possibly the only major country which did not participate either in 2017 or in 2019. And I have given the reasons for that. And in 2019, it became very clear that all the arguments that India had made about the debt trap, about non-sustainability, about non-transfer of technology, about non-generation of employment or jobs, non-benefit uh, to uh, the recipient country, all that has come out to be true. And in 2019, when the Belt Road Forum took place, then China was forced to say, yes, there are these problems in humility. It said these are these problems and we will try to address them. Now, let us look at what is the situation today. Uh, you know, to respond to your question, I don't think India by itself can advance that sort of funding or money to these countries which are really looking for infrastructure. But I think we can, in partnership with other countries, for instance, with Japan, you know, when the last India-Japan summit took place, both the leaders, Prime Minister Modi and Shinzo Abe, they decided we will take up projects which are in Bangladesh and in Sri Lanka. Uh, with the United States, you know, their MCC, the Millennium uh, Fund that they have, to promote infrastructure in developing countries. There also we are working together with them. We have the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. Yes. That also we are working with Japan. So I think in consort with other countries, we can definitely try to promote infrastructure. The last point there, you know, which is both economic and strategic, you know, like we were talking about Huawei and ZT is both strategic security as also economic. You know, in the last few years, India has taken uh, interest in ports in Indonesia, the Sabang port in Indonesia, in northern part. 
the Dukum port in uh, Oman. So those are places where India is working with those countries to develop them. You know, like China is trying to create a string of pearls around India, whether it is Gwadar and Hambantota and Chakfu. So we have our own outposts. We are creating our own outposts, whether it is in Seychelles, whether it is in Mauritius, whether it is in Oman or in Indonesia. Right. So I think in partnership with other countries, we can definitely try to put up some sort of a challenge as far as the BRI is concerned. A very well explained. I, I'll come back to uh, uh, Dr. Batra if you can respond to me. Uh, Dr. Batra there? Uh, okay. So uh, I think the time is short, but then I request uh, General Panwa to, to make a concluding remark about how do we not miss now the opportunity uh, and we see uh, the, the, the emergence of China is forever, uh, is not limited to yesterday or today. How we'll form such a cohesive policies and should we reach out openly to our make alliance, say Quad or, or say some, some other alliances, uh, what is your outlook on this uh, gender panwa from the military perspective? Uh, before that, uh, since uh, Ambassador Sajanar uh, was talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, if I may just give uh, one or two points on that. You know, Go that ahead. was the actual Belt and Road Initiative. A very important component of this entire BRI is the Digital Silk Road. Now, the Digital Silk Road Really speaking, while India refused to participate in the BRI, but it got willy-nilly sucked into certain aspects of the digital Silk Road in terms of you know the infrastructure, including you know Huawei involvement in our systems, then um, uh, the payment portals, the e-commerce aspects, the e-commerce payment portals, Paytm etc. Whatever we are looking at, this is all part of the digital Silk Road. So we've got involved in it. And with this watershed coming into place and the security aspects, not just from the economic point of view, we have to wean away from these from the security perspective. Another very important component of the Digital Silk Road is the OFCs, which are which China is building up. It's got a 20% today stake in the entire undersea cables OFC through which 98% of the world data passes. So the control over data, which China gets through 5G, through OFC, and through the data centers, which are all part of the Digital Silk Road, is really speaking the oil of tomorrow. And this is what we have to now wean ourselves away to whatever extent we've got ourselves embroiled into it. Now coming to military perspective of alliances, et cetera, uh, well, um, Ambassador Sajana talked about the Quad and Australia coming in. So these alliances will automatically now, I feel, realign itself because the manner in which um, China is finding itself through its, I would say, untimely assertiveness. It probably felt that it can assert itself, but it will find, I, I mean, in my assessment at least, uh, the rebound which is occurring uh, will be in a manner that things like the quad and the maritime domain, which is also uh, talked about just now, where we are very well positioned as far as the Andaman and Nicoar position for blocking the Malacca Straits, etc. So building up on our uh, Andaman Nicoar command to, you know, and in conjunction with uh, other countries involved with the South China Sea, etc., so these alliances in the maritime domain also will build up uh, of democratic countries vis-a-vis -vis the ideological domain also will come into the picture. So I feel these alliances are bound to come up in some manner or the other. So that's um, how uh, I think uh, uh, time is running out else we can keep continue. I think this is a wonderful debate. Uh, General Panwar has pointed out uh, how we focus, how we should not miss the opportunity for new kind of warfare. Uh, we can spend money on tanks uh, at the moment now, but we must focus on the kinetic warfare, warfare of cyber warfare, those warfare of the future. Uh, uh, Ambassador Ashok, uh, I think, very pertinent point about the threat. Not again, the missed opportunity, have policies. 
and Professor uh, Srikant uh, rightly pointed out, you know, about the policies towards China and what China is thinking, you know, only he can know uh, such, such authority. I thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, panelists here coming on BWB in this world. This is Manish Kumar Jha. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ambassador.